Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Mikko Rapeli and this is my colleague Maria Gullard. We are from BMW Car IT and we are here to present uh, a, a talk about continuous integration and testing of a Yocto project based automotive head unit. Uh, first of all, a few words about BMW Car IT. It was founded in 2001. It's a small, small subsidiary of BMW AG and we are basically a software house inside BMW. We do products for the uh, BMW products, um, as well as some research and, and also open source software product there. Um, of course, BMW makes cars, and in those cars, for example, this is an i8 hybrid uh, engine car with uh, carbon fiber chassis and whatnot. And it's inside the car, uh, in the cockpit next to the driving, uh, driving wheel is the head unit with a big display. And here on the bottom uh, left you can see the display of the head unit showing the maps and navigation data for the driver. Usually the driver uses a simple uh, round joystick and a bunch of buttons to control this display. And of course this head unit is connected to the other buses in the car and uses uh, various data from there to display and, and convenience features. Our product setup. Um, basically to develop a head unit for BMW cars. Um, connected multimedia computer with navigation and, and telephony and other features. Several companies are involved, physically distributed uh, in Germany and other countries. We have hundreds of developers at various levels of the software stack. Um, due to these multiple companies, also really complex uh, IT and, and CI infrastructure, which means we have a few technical and partially also political obstacles in, when setting up technical solutions for various things. Um, requirements for our, our CI system, basically to provide fast feedback for developers, integrators and product organization. Um, basically multi-stage CI is the implementation where the first phase is a software component change verification inside an SDK environment. Basically we build the software components in the SDK and execute all the unit tests that are available. In the software integration for the whole system, we then do CI builds for the full system, for all targets, for all images and then have some quality assurance checks around that, and then do actual on-target on uh, testing with the provided images, and then provide results to the CI system. So to implement this build system, we use the Octo, which uh, I'll go really quickly over this because it's kind of basic information about the Octo, but uh, just for those of you who don't know the Octo, it's a Linux-based cross-completion framework uh, it uses as, uh, as uh, sources metadata, which is, can be configuration files or recipes that implement tasks. It has a task scheduler, which is called Bitbake, which consumes its inputs, the, the metadata, and generates uh, as outputs packages, images, tool chains, SDKs, etc. cetera. Uh, one of the, the, the characteristics is, is performance of Bitbake. It can be really fast, but it compiles a lot. So one of, uh, two of the, the, the main things for performances is the shared sys roots and the, the caching of Bitbake. So we, can, we will see in the, the next slides that especially the sys roots, which is shared, can be a source of problems in our case. So some uh, neat features and characteristics of Yocto. It's very flexible. We can basically do anything we want with it. Uh, we have very fine-grained control on the output artifacts. We have the possibility of config configuring it in compile time, which we cannot easily do with uh, package-based distributions. It's very extensible. We can add or extend it. Uh, it provides a very useful thing, which is license tracking. Uh, so we can specify what license uh, we cannot ship, which is kind of crucial for legal reasons. And uh, it has commercial and community support. Both of all uh, of them are very good. And another neat <coughs> thing is QA checks, which we extensively use to guarantee some basic uh, quality on our projects. So some words on source code management. As Miko said, we have some uh, component builds and system builds. So this is about components. Uh, basically, the source can come in these uh, three types. We can have public open source sources, uh, internal projects, internal to the company, 
and binary deliver, uh, deliveries from suppliers. So it's usually in subversion, and it's really binary. We don't need to compile this. So here is the, the more complex, oh, just some words here uh, to give you a better idea what software components mean. For example, take BizBox. It's usually a single repository that you just fetch the source or the tarball and compile. And the system components is actually a little, bot, a little bit more elaborate. So we basically have Yocto project, uh, some open source meta layers, some proprietary meta layers that we keep in the company. Um, all these components are Git repositories, and you, we use submodules to, to manage them. So <clears throat> to have a, sorry, a revision in our repository or a version, we just tag the base uh, repository with Git submodules. Uh, there are some drawbacks about using this approach. It, it can be a bit, a bit confusing for new developers coming to Git. Uh, <clears throat> adding or removing submodules is a bit tricky to uh, test in our CI infrastructure, and it's not nicely integrated to Garrett, Git Web, or Git Tools. For example, Repo, which we haven't tried yet in, in this project, is, has a, a much better integration to Garrett, but we, unfortunately, we don't use it. So we use, you, we use Garrett as a code review tool and a server for Git repositories. We use the, the concept of topics to group many commits. So when we want to build a change, a change is usually in a topic that can be composed by multiple commits. We have a custom tool to check out the topics into our local copy of the, the repositories, so we can easily test a topic, for example, in a local machine. Uh, <clears throat> CI jobs can verify changes with the same topic, and that's what we use for verification builds. Uh, a positive aspect of the use of Garrett, it's quite straightforward for experienced, experienced developers. Uh, it works quite well if people know what they are doing. But uh, it's a bit bad for uh, developers with not a lot of experience. And so they make some mistakes like mixing unrelated changes in a single Git repository, for example, under, this, under the same topic. Usually that should not be like that. And for example, they, they could try to merge commits that are not part of the same branch too. Yeah, the, the UI is not very good, it's a bit confusing. And uh, in our case, the, the, the Garrett version that we are using is not really up to date. There are some alternatives like Patchwork, GitHub, GitLab, but we don't really use them. So about the source code change integration, for the, the component uh, case, which is the simplest, uh, it's very easy. It's just a normal Git workflow. We commit and merge changes. And the system integration is a, a little bit more complex uh, because it, uh, a single change can involve multiple repositories. So we have to create a topic, submit. It goes through a verification build, and it also goes to peer review. And once we, we get a, a positive review and a successful build, it goes through a, 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 a board of managers that may approve or not this change. So only after this approval that we get the change integrated. OK, so then I'll explain a few, in a few slides our, our CI pipeline. For the software component builds, like I said, we compile in the SDK, um, and the developers work with the SDK. Then the dev developers push their changes to Garrett for code review, and their peers need to review the code for with a plus two, and then the Garrett also triggers a verification builds within the SDK in our CI environment, which also executes unit tests. In case the verification is successful, the changes can be either automatically or manually merged into the base repo of the software component, usually the master branch. For the system integration, we have two types of integration requests, which are basically multi-git tree pull requests. Um, they can be automatically or manually submitted from a component repo, when, for example, the master branch moves forward with a couple of uh, new commits, and the only change that need, needs to be done is that the BitBaker recipe has a new hash. Uh, for the more complex scenarios, we have a system integration carry topic, which, for example, changes a number of BitBaker recipes in a number of different meta layers to produce some new feature. 
and we bundle these into a one Gerrit topic and then verify and fix those, uh, verify and review those. So the multi-state CI comes with from the SDK build, SDK verification for a single component, then complete system builds for system-wide changes, and also before releases, we also tested that our merge was successful and didn't break anything. So here's our workflow. Developer with your software component, developer works with Git changes, pushes them to Gerrit, um, into Git, and that triggers an SDK verification build and unit test execution in the CI environment. And from this, we get the verification results. And then we require that the developer's code changes are also reviewed, so that it is to be a plus two in Gerrit. If all of this is fine, then the changes can be merged back into the system, into the master branch of the software component. In the CI environment for the SDK builds, the, the SDKs come from actually released versions of our base system from Bitbake. And we automatically update the latest SDK in every, every CI instance. For the system change verifications, like I said, a single component can change its new, into a new Git hash in, in the Bit, Bitbake recipe, or a software integration works with a number of Bitbake recipes and a number of layers and, and pushes these changes into Git in a single topic. This triggers a system build in the CI environment, which also executes the bud tests in the real, real target hardware environment. If all of this passes, there will be a verification plus one result in, in Gerrit review. And of course, we require that the integrators also do peer review, and there needs to be a plus two in Gerrit. If all of these are fine, the system allows the integrators to send an integration request, which is basically a pull request for multiple good trees into the next stage. So in the system release stage, the input is the integration requests, basically changes in Bitbake recipes or other stuff in the meta layers, also classes and so on. First, these, these changes go into a change control board, which, uh, which is then under the control of our release managers, who then decide what kind of changes are now prioritized for the, this today's release or tomorrow's release and so on. Then they bundle up a bunch of integration requests, into, which are the merge into the base repository, and, and then this whole merge is again tested with the same system build, built or images, and also execute. Uh, hardware and, and all other bad tests. If all is fine, results come back to the <coughs> CI system, which automatically then publishes these results. It tags the base key tree and publishes all built artifacts like images, SDKs, and caches, and so on. And the images, of course, to the, go to the further stages of testing in our release process. Um, yeah, as mentioned, the, the integration requests are applied and tested in a full system build. There's a change control board which can, which can control what stuff goes in. And these integration requests are collected together and pushed out as a release, so daily. Uh, new, re new releases can be created manually with the change control board, who select which stuff goes in and when, or based automatically based on a timer. Every four hours, for example, comes out a release. And all integration requests are automatically accepted. But usually this is a bit tricky when you actually want to control what stuff goes into a release. Okay, some words on uh, our CI infrastructure. So as we mentioned already, it's based on Garrett, Git, and some subversion servers. We use Jenkins to orchestrate all the builds. We use mostly virtual machines. At the moment, we have two bare metal machines. They are quite powerful, as you can see the, in the numbers. And additionally to these uh, CI builds, we have one daily or nightly build from scratch without uh, Bitbake's state cache. So, and we also have some minor uh, uh, services as file and cache servers, database, cluster, and uh, issue trackers. Well, these are, slides are going to be available, so I'm not really going to details about the numbers, so you can quickly see them here and then take a look at these slides. So then our test farm with, uh, basically we have a test farm with special hardware, including the real target devices. We have a Jenkins master which takes in a, in a, a new re test candidate, whether it's a uh, sort of build candidate or a release. Um, then it triggers or uses a Python based test farm framework which uses RapidMQ uh, to handle all the requests to different executors. And basically we have 16 SDK and 20 virtual targets and 12 real target executors at the moment. These numbers are varying based on time and day and whether the machines are still alive. Um, so besides the test time, we also have some automated tests for the build artifacts uh, just to do some checks as early as possible. For example, if the flashing tools are broken or missing from the release images, then we don't, don't you even try to put them into testing. Some statistics, here's a weekly statistics. So we run thousands of tests every week for different test targets. 
uh, unfortunately I had to filter out some of the details, so these are not really interesting except to give an overview of how big our system is. Daily statistics, we work in, in Europe most of the time, so it's going to be German time frame and, and the office hours when the system is most busy. And the execution times that we have, the most time consuming part in our case is the actual real target hardware test where the flashing takes quite a considerable, considerable amount of time. For virtual targets and, and SDK, which we also test, the, time, the execution times are much, much shorter. Some, some lessons learned from all of this. Keep it simple, as simple as you can. Um, use solid foundations. We have had some hard lessons that we did not use some distributed system technologies but tried to hack around with Jenkins and SSH and rsync and so on. Um, and of course, one of the sad facts is if working in, in a company is that sometimes the corporate networks and the services provided there are not as reliable as, for example, GitHub. Um, this is true for our current company, but also other companies that I've actually at least worked with. Um, and also automate everything, including the ser server and system setup with Ansible and Puppet and so on. And virtualization, it might be a good idea for some IT managers, but it actually is not good for build performance in, in Bitbag environments. Um, so positive aspects, uh, we have done a system that works and that actually fulfills our requirements. It's a bit of pain sometimes to administer, and I also admit that also our users are sometimes quite loud and complaining that stuff doesn't work correctly. Um, the negative aspects, like, like I mentioned, Jenkins isn't really a distributed system, even though it can trigger, you can trigger remotely a job on another Jenkins master, but that actually doesn't work quite reliably. And we haven't automated all bits and pieces, but we're working on that and trying to push everything into Ansible. Um, and some changes in our CI infrastructure cannot actually be tested by the infrastructure or the CI jobs themselves. For example, rolling out new Jenkins versions or Jenkins module changes. So some details about the builds. Well, for the software component builds, which are the simplest, we use uh, SDK build, uh, SDK based builds. So the SDK which is generated by uh, the Bitbake build is used to build the component builds. Uh, the component software. So as an optimization, we use Ccache in this case. So the system build is the most complex and uh, long, uh, long, the longest one. It runs inside an LXC container with Ubuntu 14.04. Uh, we do this because, as it's probably known, uh, Bitbake is not really reliable when it comes to host contamination. We have some uh, leaks into the, the build system. So we use the container to at least have a control on what may leak into our build. So uh, with this, we can uh, have some uh, relatively control what goes into the final product, although we have, may have some leaks in the, in the build system. And this container approach also allows developers to use whatever Linux distribution they want and the, the container changes usually can be deployed faster than if, if we had to make some infrastructure changes. So for the implementation of this, we have a, a little wrapper on, uh, around Bitbake, which is a shell script. It's uh, just an implementation detail in this case, but we, we learned that we have to fail as early as we can, <laughs> as lesson learned, and we should clean up stuff after we finish the process. So some numbers on the meta layers. We have a quite big scenario here for the build system. We have more than, uh, actually these numbers are not really up to date. We have a little bit more than 60 meta layers, more than 2,800 recipes, and more than 400 BB appends for Bitbake. Uh, for the configuration of the build system, we use the, the stock local conf Config, uh, global configuration uh, file for Bitbake. We have some sad magic to set some configuration variables. And uh, differently free from the stock Bitbake, we have a little script to determine the parallelization options for Bitbake. I'm gonna talk a little bit more into details about this. So we have a single recipe, special recipe that we use to build everything. Uh, in this recipe, we, uh, we have dependencies on uh, other recipes that create uh, about nine images. Uh, these images include the flashing and uh, testing tools. 
and we have some performance issues with the build of images because images, the generation of images cannot be really parallelized because the package manager, which is used to build up the, the image, is a, a sequential. We cannot install packages in parallel. Although we can build images, we have nine, we can build images in parallel. Each image it cannot be parallelized. We actually have some optimization with regard to the compression of images. We use PIGZ for parallel compression. It's a parallel implementation of GZ. And our images are actually tarballs. They are not file system images. The, the flashing tools actually create the file system <coughs> and deploy the, the, to the target correctly. OK, then a few words about our SDK. So we use a custom SDK instead of the Octo, Octo upstream version. Um, we do this in a bit different way. So our SDK mixes target and native SDK packages in a way that is actually really transparent to the users. The motivation is that developers have struggled with the cross tool chain and the cross environment setup and made mistakes in the CMake setup. Um, in our way, um, the complexity of the basically the cross compilation mm -hmm. setup is shifted from the developers to us integrators who, who manage the SDK. Um, the SDK is also decoupled from the images, so we can have some stuff in the images which is actually not allowed for the developers to use, but for various reasons we need to provide it in the images. So we have a tighter control of the APIs that we expose to developers and, and, and urge them to use. Uh, we use a custom namespace tooling instead of a plain ch root to execute the, the environment of the SDK without root access. And basically, that means that when you are inside our SDK, normal commands like CCC make, out of tools, CMake, and other, everything just works out of the box. From user's perspective, this is just a lightweight CH root environment. Um, for the SDK, we have also tests for everything because we've noticed that even trivial changes or, or trivial tests find bugs, and trivial changes can trigger bugs. Um, we don't use the Yoxto upstream SDK test, we have our own, but we are working on getting some, some collaboration done here. Um, and these tests are also executed every time when we build an SDK in the CI system. We also have a Qt creator based IDE with a custom plugin to connect our SDK into the Qt creator, so it's de quite de developer friendly. Um, and our SDK approach yeah, hasn't been upstream, but we're working on that as well. Um, then our SDK is actually the execution controller in our CI te automated testing environment. So we deliver both the test controller and the Thing that we test together into the system and they automatically can be updated at the same time. And our iPackage archive, our package archive is performed with this iPackage uh, where we have, of course built a number of additional tools, debug symbols and development packages what, which are not available in the <coughs> SDK by default or in the images. Uh, due to the complexity of our uh, infrastructure with other multiple companies, we don't have a single iPackage repository server unfortunately but we do distribute these, these uh, artifacts uh, to different companies using various protocols and servers and whatnot. Um, yeah, some debug tools are only available in the package repository, for example, the GPL v3, and we can distribute it in the images. Um, we don't at the moment support any incremental updates to the SDK or images because of we can provide a single package repo or package stream. And, um, also, we unfortunately don't run a PR server at the moment, uh, so we don't bump the, the version numbers of the packages in the binary packages automatically. We are planning to deploy that, but so far it hasn't been a huge issue for us. So, some as a feedback to the Yocto community, some difficulties that we are having with Yocto. Since our team is quite large and not many people are very experienced with Yocto, mm -hmm. Uh, we have some difficulties with writing proper recipes. At the moment, uh, our uh, reference for quality in terms of uh, recipes is the, the ones that we use from Pocky. Uh, another major issue that we have is the shared sysroot approach that is used by, by Bitbake that can lead to many race conditions and issues with dependencies that may sometimes be available in the sysroot, sometimes not depend on the, the parallelization of the tasks. So that, that leads to random build failures when the dependencies are not properly specified. We have many problems with this. Uh, in our case, mostly because of this issue with the, share, the, the shared sysroots is that our builds are at the moment not reproducible at least not if we use parallelization options. If we probably, if we build sequentially, it would take forever, 
but it would be reproducible, but that's not the case, that's not feasible in this case. Uh, another issue that we have is that some developers uh, actually use package managers from other languages like Java's Maven or JavaScript's NPM and not properly integrated into uh, Yachtl. So they, for example, call NPM from a do configure or do compile task and NPM would download stuff from the internet and that won't be properly cached, not properly verified by the bitbake fetcher and they may lead to build issues. And since it, it usually doesn't happen for the person who codes it, uh, they just assume that it's fine and push the results. And it may even succeed in a verification build, but in random cases, it breaks builds. Uh, additionally, this way of doing things wrong, uh, we, don't ha we don't get license tracking, which is quite important for us. So this is something that we have to address. And uh, Bitbake sometimes uh, rebuilds some dependents even when it's not strictly, strictly required. For example, when we are sure that ABI or API compatibility is preserved, but even if we change something in the recipe, Bitbake will recompile everything depending on, on the task we, which is affected, of course. And this, this leads to long build times. So here we have some numbers on the on the, the builds, this is per machine. We currently have, have, it, have two machines. So we have more than 2,000, uh, 20, 22,000 Bitbig tasks and these numbers that are really go quickly over them. They will be available in the slides after that. So our build profile, our build may range from 20 minutes to five hours on those powerful machines that we showed. It depends on the caching, how much Bitbake is caching. The, the best case, it's 20 minutes. In the worst case, five hours. Uh, in our experience, build performance can be quite hard to optimize. There are countless variables to tweak in the build, including hardware variables, system variables, Bitbake variables. So it's really hard to optimize. And in, in our case, we have some quite heavyweight components, C++ based, that are really interdependent, so we change one, we have to recompile a lot of things. And still about performance, in our build profile we have some uh, uh, nine images at the moment, and they are not parallelizable, so the generation of these images can be a little bit time consuming. Uh, to help to analyze the, the profile of our build, the, the build stats uh, data as generated by Bitpick has been very useful. So after the build is done, we still have some post-processing steps, which is basically checking the, the presence of the expected files. In case of a release, we have to prepare the state cache as generated by Bitbake to feed the next builds. Uh, pushing artifacts like packages, images, SDK logs, etc. And well, as I mentioned, after a, a release, a new SDK is deployed into the system so we can build uh, uh, software components using the new SDK based on the, the previous release. Okay, then some optimizations that we have done. First of all, tip, regarding the build performance. So first of all, uh, you need to measure certain aspects of your build slaves, for example. The, the basic uh, things are CPU uses, memory uses, disk uses, or local I.O. and network I.O. What I would, so I would, what we have found useful is to use Performance Copilot and its tooling for that. You can quite easily see what is the CPU utilization in a parallel or with multiple CPUs and is the memory effectively used or is everything going down through disk access and I.O. or even to network. Um, we also have a download cache where we have a separate build job which runs a, a bit a bit pay build with, with the task fetch all and that populates a download cache for us, and this is exported with an NFS to all our build slaves. This uh, uh, does not fully validate that the downloads are okay after fetch all. I mean, the compilations, or there might be someone, some download might have failed, and the system might have not noticed it, um, or, or it doesn't also notice that if something is actually wrong in the setup. So sometimes we have had that corrupted downloads that have led to build failures in, in the build farm, and that's really tricky to debug. And ideally, of course, we would rather like to run all builds in an offline mode and with no network access in, in, in Bitbake and so on, but unfortunately, this hasn't been the case in our environment, at least not yet. 
So about the parallelization settings of Bitbake. Bitbake uh, currently has two main variables to customize in case we want to tweak the parallelization. It uses two variables, BB number of threads and parallel make. Both of them by default are set to the number of CPU cores. In our particular case, it doesn't scale very well because as we mentioned, we have some quite heavy C++ based components that take a lot of memory to compile. So in our case, for example, we have builders with 16 CPU cores. If we multiply BB number of threads and parallel make, we have, in the worst case, uh, 256 compilation tasks running at the same time. That can be quite heavy if we are running C++ compilers. So what actually happened at, is that some builds just crashed because of they, they ran out of memory. So as lessons learned, uh, we had to measure, measure and set resource limits for bit-based tasks. That's currently not implemented, but ideally it could be implemented with C groups. So we could crash the specific task that is causing the out of uh, memory error. Uh, ideally, the bitbake scheduler should take into account the, the system load when it's scheduling new, new tasks. It doesn't happen. So if the system is completely trashed, bitbake will happily schedule new tests even if they are completion tasks. And as I mentioned before, optimal parallelization is very hard to get. For example, the, the, the builds depend, uh, what we build depend on what's cached. So when we have Lots of caching, high parallelization is desired. When we have low caching, so we have a lot of compilation, low or less parallelization is desirable. So what we've done, and we mentioned before, is we use a custom script that instead of using just the number of CPU cores as input, we also take the available memory as input. Here's the basic logic of this script. It will be available for you to take a look in the slides after that. Okay, then we have tuned our build slaves a bit. So basically what we want to do is to avoid disk I.O. as long as possible. That means that our, our bitbag builds basically run with RM work enabled. So that means that any task when it's executed and, and the state of, uh, data is no longer needed, bitbag will clean up the workspace for that. Um, here is our, some syscontrol settings for Linux to tune the VM values so that uh, the rights to I.O. are avoided. You can also go into details later on. But, and also basically we want to avoid swapping as much as possible. A lot of RAM help up to a certain point, but for example, on our machines, we tried to upgrade from 64 gigabytes of RAM to 128 gigabytes of RAM with 40 CPU cores, and build times did not improve at all. So more aggressive parallelization options easily lead to system trashing and thus actually slower builds. So our solution has been basically to try to experiment and, and our, with our build profile and tune the parameters and actually measure the results. Then we have some quality assurance and security stuff that we also do in our, in our system. We have static code analysis using CodeSonar. It basically uses uh, shared programming rules to, and uh, checks for these errors in, in the code. Basically finds memory leaks, buffer overflows, and race conditions, and so on. It's basically similar to what Coverity does, if, it's, if you're familiar with that. Uh, all of our bitback recipes are compiled using CodeSonar compiler wrapper. Uh, this is slow. Uh, we cannot do incremental builds at the moment. Uh, and it takes roughly five days to execute, so we do it basically weekly. It's completely automated, but we cannot uh, integrate it easily into the CI workflow. But we provide these reports, for example, every week. Then we do open source license compliance checking. Basically, we use the license information provided by the Bitbag recipes. But additionally, we also have Black Ducks uh, tooling for this, and we analyze the source code for license violations. This, again, is also automated, uh, but not directly connected to the CI workflow. Also, we're interested in security vulnerability analysis tooling. Uh, we've seen the patches floating around in the Yocto uh, open, em open embedded core mailing list and tried them out and they seem promising, but we're also looking into Black Duck because it provides similar features and we already have the tool. So now we are going to the conclusions on Yocto project, which is our main tool to, to build the, our software. Uh, in our experience, the community support is excellent. Mailing lists, IRC, bug tracker is very good. The doc documentation is also very good, but the system is very complex. It's not easy. Uh, as we mentioned before, the, 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 the layers provided by Yocto are our reference in terms of quality. 
uh, it's very difficult for us to, to reach the same level of quality as, uh, as EACTO projects layers. And we also have some problems, uh, most of them uh, due to the design decisions uh, made for Bitbake. The shared sys roots leads to race conditions and depends on the issues in our builds. Uh, Bitbake in, in Yocto in general has a, a huge amount of global and multiple variables that are changed all along the build. <coughs> in our case, we don't have re reproducible builds. Uh, that's something we are working on to achieve in the near future. Okay, so lessons learned about the whole CI setup. Basically, CI systems can be used to automate every task or required in the software development process. CI system builds find bugs, uh, even testing, even if trivial, will find bugs, and that's really good. But and culture, cultural change is required, so we work in the automotive environment, and some developers and product partners actually appreciate the fast feedback that the system provides. Unfortunately, some don't. Some don't like to let their code and bad code is published and, and they get the penalty right away. Um, then quality of service, in, like I mentioned in the corporate networks, can make some CI setups really difficult. This is because of reli reliability is more, mostly chained. Uh, this means, that, for example, you have a source code server with 5% uh, failure rate, for example, due to network issues or whatever, or a build, failure, build reliability due to the mentions, mentioned fact in the bitback, for example, <laughs> of 10%, and that you have some instability in your testing maybe hardware related and so on, and you have 10% failure rate there. And if you count them, these all together by multiplying the, the, the values, you will fi find a 23% failure rate even though you haven't changed anything in your system. And that's something that our users are of course complaining about if this happens a lot. And if you do, the more stuff you do in your more CI system, the more variables we will have and all of this adds to instability. But on the other hand, the system actually does work. So, that was our presentations. Would you have any questions to us? <laughs> Go ahead. There are many difficulties in the project. Yep. Why do you choose the project? That's a good question. So, the question is why did we choose the Octo project? Um, I think it's because of our, our partners, uh, the suppliers in, in the automotive domain were familiar with Yocto and basically provided the, the platform with, the, as a, with, with support. So we use commercial support from our supplier for Yocto. That doesn't mean that sometimes all issues are fixed in their supplies, but <coughs> we also do that interact with them. And we are open to suggestions on something better <laughs> because yeah. in our experience, and as far as, as we know, we don't know any better tool for this task. Yeah. Yeah. And as a, as a personal note, I've been checking out the Debian-based discussions here. Yeah, go ahead. We have hundreds. So exact numbers, I don't even know, because some of them are hidden behind, behind other companies, but we have hundreds of developers working on the system. We don't have hundreds of developers working on the Bitbag system, but overall, we have hundreds of developers. Okay, the, how, how big is the team in, that set, up, set this whole thing up? Um, we started off with a few developers working on, on, on the Bitbake environment and SDK. <laughs> then it grew up, at the moment there we have 10, 10 people team, but these are also used as an experts in integrating whatever needs to be integrated into the system. So they are consultants in the whole project. Then we have infrastructure team. Uh, I think it also was a one person doing it initially, wrapped up to now I think five persons. Then we have a whole team maintaining the test infrastructure, test automation stuff, and I think there's more than 10 people at the moment working on that. So these teams are quite big, but on the other hand, we can get in a two hours all of these results back in the project. How many contributions per day? Um, at the moment, there is a, a bit of a limit with the integration. So, um, it's a bit difficult to count. So in the Yocto world, we can quite easily count how many git commits are coming in, but it's not difficult, or it's a bit more difficult to determine how many changes happened in the software component trees, for example. At the moment, I would say that we are working on two to three releases a day to the system, and each release would contain, I would say, at least a 10, 10 integration requests, which are some kind of features implemented in the whole, whole system. Yeah, but those are changes related to the layers, yeah, not to exactly. the software components. Yeah. So yeah. the software component change may be 100. Okay, next question. Uh, which, uh, two questions, which Yakko version are you using? 
Jethro. Jethro. And then um, your automated testing, does it include GUI testing or audio testing or anything beyond? Um, so we have multiple levels of testing. So the testing that we use in, in the tightest and fastest CI chain uh, does not include anything but the target hardware and an SSH connection to the target hardware. So all additional hardware is, is in, in the further stages of testing, which we also have automated, but it ha doesn't happen inside the CI, CI loop. Uh. <laughs> there. Yeah, so I guess the first question is how does it relate to Genevi? Um, this is a BMW product and BMW is quite heavily involved in Genevi. So we have a number of software components from the Genevi work in our system. That's one thing. Second question was about using Zcash and other build performance enhancements. So we use at the moment state cache heavily. Uh, uh, Zcash would be nice to have in some environments, especially where you can easily store it. Uh, transmitting or transferring C, C, complete C cache of the whole Yocto built into some machine and distributing it across machines, that is, I guess, way too heavy for anything. But if you have a local team specific build server where usually just a couple of components are built, then using a local build slave specific C cache would be nice. But unfortunately, Yocto doesn't officially support it at the moment. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so we have a team who builds the test, test infrastructure, builds the test frameworks, for example. Um, they do write some tests as an example, but in theory, the, 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 the people and developers of an individual component should write tests for that component. Also, this integration test, testing. So they should write the unit test, and they should write the sort of um, test that you would run on a target hardware when your component is, is updated there, that its interfaces are up and running. Unfortunately, this isn't always true, and the, the, the quality level of different developers varies a lot, and that causes problems then in the CI, of course. <laughs> there. It, uh, you said that when you release the entire system, you have some post process days where you have to prepare uh, the caches. Yep. Cache. What do you mean exactly? So we. As far as I remember, we use state cache mirroring technique. So we, we prepare a state cache mirror. I think there's some symlink, hard link magic involved in that. I can't remember any of the details. You just store them. Yeah, yeah, we store them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, basically, we use the output of a release as input for the, the, the compilations after the, the release. Of Yocto. Yeah. Oh, so the question is how, how does our SDK work with the Yocto SDK? I think it could be an alternative. So uh, it, our SDK is honestly a bit too easy to use. Uh, we've seen quite a bit of software components where they actually have hard coded path and so on. And we don't, they're actually then writing the, the bit bake recipe for the stuff which was used, compiled in the SDK becomes really difficult if you find that someone just hard coded the path of user lib include or use user lib or, or user include. Uh, what I would like to have is that our SDK would export CC and, and, and LD flags and, and so on environment variables, but we don't do that at the moment. So I see it as an alternative to Yocto. We, we could discuss it, and we've been actually maintaining it across multiple Yocto releases already, so yeah. We'll, we'll see. There. Do you have some recommendation on this problem of the auto rebuild in the whole chain of dependencies? You know, when it starts, just rebuild everything. From okay, so the so question is how, how to maybe prevent Yocto from rebuilding everything. So, uh, 
uh, I'll just let you know on how, how we're thinking of this could be solved. So one, we could run, there is an open source API, API checker tool chain which could be used to verify that, for example, a library did not break its API. And that tool could be used to detect that, for example, now there's no need to trigger any more builds. It's fine that this library was compiled alone, it's still compatible. It's not part, so it's an open source tool. Uh, we have some proof of concept hacks where we tried to see if this can be done. And uh, for example, our SDK has this tooling also in integrated so developers could use it. But now the big thing is would be to hook it into Bitbake somehow. Yeah, and uh, a smarter use of S state cache could help to, if you merge several S state caches into a single one, it could help, but it's kind of a lot of work to do. Yeah. Yes. So um, the question is how, how our SDK is big and how do we update it or how developers update it. Um, it is true that our SDK is big and not, uh, not many components actually change that often in the SDK. Unfortunately, we've had some problems uh, distributing or providing a single package repository so we can easily provide updates to them, to developers. Um, our SDK is big, but on the other hand, I think uh, there was something also on the slides that we are, are able to in the CI system and also developers can extend nowadays their SDK environment for their packages if they want to try something out or install debug symbols and some additional tooling. It is possible, but it requires some manual work. In the CI system, it's actually automatic and also in the test environment, we actually install our target images, for example, they don't have anything except SSH enabled. All the other stuff comes from the SDK and is installed on demand to the target to, for example, enable some testing. So if the test requires special tooling on the target, it's not actually in the images and we just install this when, pre when preparing for the testing on demand. Um, <coughs> not a good answer maybe, but, but uh, yeah, I cannot answer any better. Yes? Uh, when you run unit tests, how do you run unit tests? Uh, I think, well, how, how do we run unit tests was the question. So I think we run mostly uh, GMOC, uh, sorry, Google tests <coughs> and that those based. Uh, G-test based testing unit test. That's what we recommend. We don't actually care how the, the developers do that, but we expect that there will be a make test basically in their build chain. And this can be configured. We run it. We run it in in the SDK environment, in which in our case mixes both target and native binaries. So it's running with the real compiled targets. And that requires that if the, if the execution environment for the target is different from your architecture that the, the build servers are running, then QM is involved. We have a question here. You talked about reliability, 76%. Will that mean that around 25% of the time the infrastructure is down, or does it mean that one out of four integration requests are failing? It, it, it means that one, uh, so the question was about a reliability example. So this wasn't a real example. I think we are a bit better in reality, but it's just an example. If you connect unreliable things into a chain, the whole throughput of the chain will be multiplication of, of those unreliabilities. And that means that every single CI execution, whether it's a, it's a topic built from a developer with a Gerrit topic, whether it's a, it's a release candidate, will have failures uh, with that percentage. For example, this 23% in that example. So in many cases, you need to re-trigger things because of various reasons. And the more stuff you have in the chain, and if they are not always 99999% reliable, then, then <coughs> you'll be in a bit of trouble. OK, yes? It's fundamentally, <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it, it's, it's fundamentally broken, let's put it this way, because Bitbake doesn't guarantee that, because it pretty much depends on the, the parallelization options and how things are parallelized. So if you build a software that depends on another one, and if that one happened to be compiled before and you don't have a proper specification of dependencies, this can build to 
and reproducible builds. Uh, one, one comment to that. So the most visible way that our, our un, unreproducible builds are visible in our, in our setup is that CI system is fine. It's great. Everything builds. But the developer who tries to build, he doesn't have maybe the same download cache or state cache and tries to build something and it fails. He sees a clear bug somewhere. And that's really annoying. Unfortunately, not yet. Okay. Yeah. Because that should, that should, uh, well, of course, um, that should unify the uh, state caches um, as it provides uh, a unified shim layer. Okay, so there was a suggestion to try Krogoth and, and yeah. hope that things are better there. Okay. Yeah, one of the approaches we are uh, trying to implement is the per recipe uh, as state cache. That's actually a, a file bug in the Octo bug tracker about this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just comment to the uh, uh, name. So <coughs> it will still not help you if your dependencies are missing. Yep. Nothing will help that. Yep, exactly. So. Until, except fixing the dependencies. Exactly, that's, that's true. But it, it's somehow easy for developers to introduce these kind of issues and, and, and ignore it. Yeah. For sure, for sure. <coughs> okay, if there are no questions. Oh, there are still some questions. Okay, go ahead. How old is this whole monster? <laughs> <laughs> ah, how old is our monster CI setup? It's actually, I would say, more than three years old, and we've been jumping through different Jethro or oh, Pokey versions and, and using different prototype environments. So this has been ramped over the years already. So we quite quite know how it works, and for sure we would like to upstream many of the solutions that we have developed, not many things, yeah. And now we have had uh, sort of prototype products which prove, for example, when selecting the right hardware for our product. We've had the same setup already running with the prototype, prototypes from various vendors, basically boards. Yes? I mean, we are active, so the question is how can we share or how you can maybe contact us. There's an email address over there. We are also actively on the Octo and Open Embedded Core mailing list. Some of guys are sending patches whenever we can. Unfortunately, we do have some time, time pressure to actually finish the product. So we can always work on the open source stuff and push stuff, up, push stuff up, upstream, but we try. We're also on the IRC, chan IRC channels also asking questions and we luckily get really good answers there. So we're there in the community. Actually, we come from Ulm. Oh, Ulm. So, but it's just, the whole product is distributed in, in Germany and other countries. Okay, I think time is running out, so thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>